We're going to get started here on what I think is probably the last lesson about elementary things in resurrection. Uh, I know we've spoken of resurrection quite a bit, I guess, lately, and that seems okay since it is of first importance and really is uh, come to realize the heart of the elementary principles. So the principles about which we speak are from Hebrews 6, 1 to 3. Uh, again, the Bible says about itself that these are the elements. I, I know that our first lesson, our first principles lessons, you know, have kind of a, an agreed upon format and, and content among the churches of Christ. But uh, I'd rather follow this one here that uh, is in the Bible. And what we have is, let us leave elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. So the letter to Hebrews is about maturity. And I should say, the maturity of that letter is the application of the Old Testament, the understanding of those things that were there. And that's why the faithful rejoice in those things when you teach about them, and the unfaithful object to those things when you teach about them, because they're not mature. But what it says is... Uh, the elementary things, the foundation that has been laid are these. Repentance from dead works, faith toward God, instruction about washings, which is baptisms, laying on of hands, which is fellowship, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. And uh, today we're talking about all of them because we're talking about the heart of the matter, the resurrection in the Gospel of John. I've really only got two chapters for you, John 6 and John 11. But it's the heart of the matter. I'll show you what I mean by this. And in reading it, I've seen a lot more things. And of course, the Bible's always that way. But certainly, this is not an exception. I've seen a lot more things. John 6, 37 to 40 is where we start. Jesus, you may recall, is teaching a crowd. The crowd uh, had been fed loaves and fishes miraculously by him. And then... He crossed over the sea and they came over to see him and said, give us more bread. And he said, you really should be concerned about spiritual things. And now we read in John 6, 37 to 40, all the father gives me will come to me. That's all people. The father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I'll never cast out. I've come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. And this is the will of the one who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. What we mean is that I should lose no one of all the people he's given me, but raise them up on the last day. This is the will of my Father as well, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. This is why we call it the heart of, of the elementary principles. We're talking about leaving the dead works, the past, trusting in God and in Christ Jesus. We'll talk some about baptism and what is it you lay hands to? What do you have? What do you accept? Those slides are just determined to move. I really don't know what happened to them. <laughs> They have a timer in them or something. It's really weird. Uh, but whatever. And uh, he speaks of resurrection of the dead and of a judgment impending here. Notice, they have to come to him and they won't be cast out. So there's repentance and there's a judgment. I've come down out of heaven not to do what I want, but to do what God wants. And what God wants is that none of those that he sends to me be lost. And I will raise them. This, the, everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I'll raise him on the last day. There is a resurrection. There is a, a, clearly an implication of a victory over, uh, over sin and over death. Well, this thing about coming down out of heaven didn't set well with some. 42 to 44 of John 6, they said, Isn't this Jesus, son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? 
uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, it is uh, the body of a man named Jesus who did grow up there, whose supposed father was Joseph, although actually he is born of God, and mother, Miriam, Mary. Yeah, that's true, sort of. How does he now say, I've come down from heaven? Well, he's God in the flesh. Is why he is the Word incarnate. Uh, John 1 talks about this Word who was with God and was God and, and how he became flesh. He pitched his tent among us. And Jesus said, don't grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. So the teaching about this is that it is exclusionary. You have to leave dead works. There is a repentance involved. And you have to trust in him and trust in God who sent him. Your approval can't be with people. It has to be with God. You're seeking to please the one who sent Jesus. And that's when you can have a resurrection in the last day, no fear of eternal judgment. In the 66th verse, we read about this account down through the 69th. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Some of the things he said were hard to accept and people didn't accept them. But he didn't apologize and he didn't change it or water it down for them. The truth is the truth. This is the mission he's on. Do you want to go away too? But Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? Good question. You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know you are the Holy One of God. You have to trust in him. You have to be willing to leave and you know, leave the old way of life and be, be with him because he's trustworthy. He is the son of God. Now, the other thing is in John 11, where Jesus says, I am the resurrection. This is intentional, completely intentional. Everything about the resurrection of a man named Lazarus. So I want to get that before you first. John's work in his gospel is to show you that Jesus is God in the flesh. That's the point of his gospel. And this is intentional. So we start in John 11, just grabbing the first six verses here, but it's worth getting it. Now, Jesus is in Jerusalem at the time. A certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, Lord, the one you love is ill. You know, somebody you care about, Lazarus, your personal friend, is ill. Okay, so these are people that he knows. They're his friends from Bethany. It's a village about two miles away from Jerusalem. It seems to be where he stayed most of the time in the Gospels. So kind of his peeps there, his friends. When Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. This is an interesting thing to say. They came to him and said, the one you love is ill. And his first response is, this illness does not lead to death. But it does, in some sense. I mean, Lazarus does die. In fact, as you'll see, he had every intention of Lazarus dying. Um, so why say it doesn't lead to death? Well, it's not final. It's not the end of the story. It's not over. It's for the glory of God. 
so the Son of God may be glorified through it. This is about God being glorified and the Son of God being glorified. What, what exactly do we mean by that? Right? Well, we're told Jesus did love Martha and her sister and Lazarus, and by this we mean they were friends. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now, that's not typically what you and I would do. Right? We heard that our friend was ill, we would rush to the bedside. But Jesus, because he loved them, stayed where he was for two more days. Hmm, what does that mean? Well, let me ask you, do you trust him? That's what it means. Do you trust him? Because he has chosen to stay there. He said this isn't to death. And in the 17th verse, if we skip ahead, Jesus on coming found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. Meaning this could have been done, you know, he could have gotten there that, that afternoon, easily. But he did not do so. He stayed for days where he was, long enough to let this man die. Three, you know, on the third day after he heard, he went to see him and the man had been dead for four. And the other thing that happens is recorded in 32 down to 37. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus uh, saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. He said, where have you laid him? They said, Lord, come see. And Jesus cried. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? Some of them said, couldn't he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Well, already you're seeing a little bit of doubt there, aren't you? This is a reference to John 9, where he did open the eyes of, the blind man, of a blind man, although the Pharisees didn't believe it. Couldn't he who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Well, probably he could have kept Lazarus from dying, if you will. I mean, obviously he can do whatever he wants. But if you're looking at it and you're saying, well, he had the ability to heal blindness, he probably could have healed whatever was wrong with this guy. Yes, probably. But whose will do you seek? Who is the Lord here? Who is calling the shots? 41st verse, Jesus lifted his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Everybody else there prayed for Lazarus, no doubt. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around so that, so that they may believe that you sent me. Now, think about this in the context of what we just read in John 6. He told them, I've come down out of heaven. I came to do the will of the one who sent me. Now, they're gathered around in front of the, the tomb of Lazarus. And Jesus said, Father, I thank you. He lifts his eyes to heaven and calls God his Father and thanks him for hearing, although he always hears. I said this aloud for everybody who's standing here to know that you sent me. So this, you know, why would you do this? Why would God grant this miracle to you if you were a sinner? And when he said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, hands and feet bound with linen strips, and face wrapped with a cloth, because that's how they did it. Jesus said to them, untie him, let him go. Yeah, he's not dead anymore. Get him out of this. And that's the end of what happened. That's how it happened. This is the view that they are getting from the outside looking in. They see this man was ill. They sent for Jesus. For whatever reason, we may or may not know, he did not come at the time that we expected him to come. 
But then when he got here, he caused this man to come out alive four days after his death, four days in the tomb. Well, let's go back to the idea of trust. As we say, it's the heart of the elementary principles. You have to leave the old way of thinking and the old way of seeing things and of reasoning and go back to this is the Son of God. He is the Lord. My reason is going not to be my own, but to be the will of the one who sent him. John eleven seven, down through 10. So before they leave, you know, on the third day, he, he says to the disciples, let's go to Judea. And they said, Rabbi, the Judeans were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? All right, objection, sir. Um, they were trying to kill you. You want to go back there? Really? That doesn't seem like a good idea, right? We think you should be safe. You can understand where they're coming from, but this is not right at all because his whole purpose is to raise Lazarus from the dead and to glorify God who sent him. Also, I have translated this, the Judeans were just now seeking to stone you. And the reason for that is that the word Jew is actually a bad translation. Uh, it is Judean. There is no word Jew in the New Testament. It is Judean. They're Judeans. And Jerusalem is at the top of the mountain and nearby, you know, down, downhill is Bethany. And that is what we would call Judea. All they're saying is, you know, we just left Judea where they wanted to kill you and you want to go back to the Judeans? That's all they're saying. It's no slight against the Jews. Uh, it's really just a place name in this case. But yeah, they're thinking about safety maybe, thinking in human terms basically. And Jesus said, aren't there 12 hours in the day? Right, things can change. If anyone walks in the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the, in the night, he does stumble because the light is not in him. What's he saying? Well, he's saying you're stumbling because you're in the dark. Do you not see the light of this world? If you walk in the day, you don't stumble because you see the light of this world. And he said to them already in John 9, I am the light of the world. If anyone walks in the night, though, he stumbles because the light is not in him. He's telling them, you know, your objection to my teaching is an indication that you don't see the light that is here among you. You don't recognize Jesus as the Son of God. You don't see him or recognize him as the authority that he is. The 11th verse, after he said uh, to them, we, we, we need to get going, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he'll recover. Another objection. <laughs> the Lord's plan and, and you know man's advice, right? The Lord said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. So when we say fallen asleep, what we mean is, well, he's dead. But when the Lord says fallen asleep, he means they can be awakened. As in, there is life after death. There is resurrection. The disciples said, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. You know, he, he needs his rest if he's going to get better. Even though the man who is the light of the world, who opened the eyes of the blind, is about to go there, you think what he needs is sleep, really. That don't make no sense. <laughs> that don't make no nonsense. Now, come on. And then, 
we follow that. Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest and sleep. Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. <laughs> and for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there, so that you may believe. Well, that's interesting too. For the sake of the people, I'm glad that I wasn't there. Everybody can know that I did not engineer this. It is not a trick. Let's go to him. Very interesting. We say he's dead, but we're going to him. Not to the tomb or his body. We're going to him. See, in the, in the, in the mind of Jesus, Lazarus is still alive, even though the body is dead. Another objection, sir. Uh, John eleven twenty one to 27. Martha said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. True. Jesus said, your brother will rise again. Martha said, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And this is the wording that Jesus used in John 6. She knows it well and she believes it. But she's also kind of Pushing back a little bit insofar as she's saying, I know, you know, we'll be united after this life is over. But Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And it's down to, do you believe this? That's really what this is about. Do you trust God? Do you believe in the resurrection? He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He's the light of this world. He's the power of this world, walking around in the flesh. But when he speaks, we should listen. Even if what he says seems contrary to our intuition, or dare we say, especially when what he says is contrary to our intuition. That's probably the best time because we're about to do something stupid. <laughs> but what he's getting at very clearly is that by believing in God, you secure for yourself eternal life. And though you die in the flesh, the second death does not harm you. Eternal condemnation in hell. You've been freed from that. She said, Lord, yes, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who's coming into the world. Which is very similar to what Peter said at the end of John 6. And very similar to what Jesus said about himself when he said, I am the bread of heaven. I've come down out of heaven. He is the Son of God coming into the world. And it's what John said earlier in his gospel in the first chapter. Also, John eleven thirty eight to 41, here we have Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And let me pause for just a moment here. Let's take a little bit of a side trip. Think about what John is doing. We said earlier he's establishing the deity of Jesus. This is true. The fact is that John is establishing this by means of repetition and expansion. He has a core cycle, a core story, set of facts, tropes or memes, if you will. And he tells them over and over and over with different stories, but expanding them with more detail. This is the penultimate, the next to the last, in the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead. The ultimate, of course, being the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. But do, do you not see how Martha echoes what was said in John 6, which echoes what was said in John 1? Do you not see how that the women are the first to hear about this resurrection and to trust in it as well? 
and the others have to be brought around. That happens even in John 2. As soon as the wedding at Cana happens, there's a woman who's listening to him and servants. Right? It's, it's everywhere. I'm telling you, that's what he's doing. So the fact that Lazarus, you know, that Jesus gave it three days before he came to raise him from the dead. The fact that uh, he's wrapped hand and foot and face and has to be untied by the people. The fact that he is laid in a cave, a stone tomb, and there's a large stone rolled in front of it that has to be rolled away. But these details are there on purpose. John is doing this on purpose. Now, back to the topic. It was a cave, a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Which is nasty, but true. That's true in the typical case. That would be bad. You don't want that. But, Jesus said, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Well, that's how this came to be. But when he said, I told you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God. And then he said what he did. You know, that, that's when he said what he did. Father, I thank you for listening to me, though you always do. I'm saying this now aloud, looking into heaven, you know, to your face for the sake of the people around here so that they will know that you listen to me and that you have sent me. And then he calls Lazarus out of the tomb. So now the invitation of heaven for you is just like it was in John 6. Do you want to go away also? 45 and 46 of John 11 record this for us, which is, uh, it's, it happens over and over. Happened in John 9. You had those that believed, who knew very well what had happened to the blind man, but then you had those who refused. So also in John 11, 45 and 46, many of the Jews, therefore the Judeans, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So you have some who do trust in Jesus. They now understand that he is the Son of God. He does have the power to raise people. Perhaps um, their memory is jogged from what they heard in John 6, and they get it now. But you do have some who still want the approval of man. They still want to be good with the authorities in that place. And they want their place in the synagogue. They don't want to get excommunicated. And so they go dutifully and uh, rat out the Lord to the Pharisees saying, well, now he's gone and done it. This horrible person has raised somebody from the dead. <laughs> who was sick and died and should have been stayed dead, you know? But <laughs> it's kind of fun in a way. Uh, if it weren't so sad, if it weren't their spiritual death, but in some sense, you know, this is a mockery. I mean, how could you possibly think that a man who raises the dead is a sinner? But people do. The question is whether you believe in him and whether you believe in the resurrection and whether you're willing to leave the synagogue, leave the approval of man. And what you will lay hands to. Do you want to hold on to the Pharisees, to the, you know, the world's approval, the world's okay and the nod, the safety and comfort of having the world on your side? Or do you want to be right with God? Do you want to attain a better resurrection? Though you will die, perhaps in the flesh, if Jesus doesn't come back first, yet you will live. Today we have water prepared that you might be baptized in the name of Jesus 
for forgiveness of sins as uh, everyone in the New Testament was instructed to do. And that is the uh, instructions about washings. It's uh, not the removal of filth from the flesh, but the answer of a conscience towards God. You believe in God. You believe in Jesus. You've changed, turned over a new leaf. And you want to serve him from now on. His blood will wash away your sins and you'll be a new creature created in him. Resurrected from the old person of sin. Walking in this world, seeing the light, having no reason to stumble. As a Christian, a child of God. Every reason to smile, every reason to rejoice. And it will be a wonderful thing having the relief in that judgment day of the word of the Lord who knows us, his servants. That will be a relief. That will be a good time. Though here we may not get much rest. It's well worth it, friends. If today you're not a Christian, become a Christian that you might obtain forgiveness of sins. If today you are a Christian but have not uh, been living right with God, we'll make things right with God. Repent. Come back to the basics of these things. Resurrection is real. You put to death that old thing, You start over in God. He has the power to do it. If you need our prayers or if you need to be baptized, let that be known now by coming to the front while together we stand, sing song, selected.